from this point forward? Um, I feel I feel definitely blessed. You know, um, this marks ten years. It marks ten years since my first album dropped. You know, and I think it, that in itself is a blessing. You know, because a lot of people don't get to, you know, experience and, and actually do what they what they love to do for this long. You know, um, and I'm definitely appreciative of that. And I always keep that in mind whenever it comes time to to do a show or whenever it comes time to create an album. I always think about how blessed I am to be in a position to still be doing what I love to do. Now. When you look at your career, and I know one, at one time you've been interviewed, you talked about, you know, with the fame and the fortune, and I know someone asked you, well, do you, do you feel have you arrived, are you famous, and you, you spoke about being at a good point that, you know, you've created people know who you are, but it's not like you have to walk around, you know, have bodyguards or something change, you can still be um, a normal person. Um, how does that, you know, when you're recording and you're making your music, how do you get away from it? Is, is there a point where, doing the careers and touring constantly, traveling all over the world, how do you get to separate from that to just be Dwelle in your own space? I'm, all, I'm always me. Yeah. <laughs> Dwelle every day. I'm always me, even on the road, you know. Um, um, I, don't try to, I don't try to separate anything. I try to, like, on, well, no, I'm not gonna say that. Because on stage, I'm a little different. I, you know, I try to be, What's the correct word? While there's cameras rolling. <laughs> um, when I'm on stage, I feel like I have to be a different person because the real me is kind of quiet. Well, the people that, well, my mother would tell you. He would, I'm probably not anymore. Everybody say hello to my mother, Miss Gardner. <laughs> my mother tell you, I used to be a, a, a real quiet kid. After you know all of this, and I had to learn how to find that inner in her ham, I guess you would call it. Um, I became a little bit more vocal, you know, but even still, like when I'm on stage, I have to almost feel like I have to become another person, you know, to, to, to do what I need to do. So I turn on for that when I'm on stage, but when I'm off stage, I'm, you know, I'm doing every day, whether I'm at home or whether I'm in Atlanta. Okay. My second home. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about the beginning. Um, at the age of six, you started re receiving piano lessons. Um, and I think maybe one of the you know, most underrated things about you that maybe most may not know is how much of a musician you are. How many instruments do you play? <laughs> you give me a harmonica, I make it do something. <laughs> <laughs> you give me a ukulele, I make it so. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I play um, play key, keys and trumpet are uh, my main instruments. Um, but I pick up a bass, I play a bass, I play, you know, a guitar. I can play it enough to, to make a song out of it, but I wouldn't get up on stage in front of people and do, mm, I do right that. No, no. How does uh, being a musician actually help you as far as crafting the music when you're recording um, versus just somebody, somebody sending you a track and just writing a song to it? How does that, you know, help with your writing? Cause I, there was an artist, Heston, who's uh, from Atlanta. He said, you know, he wrote one way, but if, when he learned how to play the guitar, it gave him a different way about uh, songwriting. How does it help you? I definitely feel like it, it helps. Um, sometimes, you know, a lot of writers, I've heard writers, you know, come to me and they're like, yo, I got this song that I want to get done, and I have the lyrics for it, and I hear this this song in my head, and they'll try to spell the song out to you, like, it goes, do 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 And it's like, that means nothing to me, you know what I'm saying? Like, nobody knows what you hear better than you. You know, and I kind of feel that way about my music. Sometimes I hear a song and it's much easier for me to go into a studio and um, sit down at the keys and, and, and bang out what I hear, grab the guitar and hear what I hear, and do what I hear the guitar doing, as opposed to me trying to, you know, uh, vocally or, or tell you in a paragraph what the guitar is supposed to do. You know what I'm saying? So I definitely think it, um, it helps when it, comes time to, when it comes time to make a complete song. As far as, um, as, far as writing, uh, I think I think you know, being a musician um, plays a role, especially when it comes to harmonies. I hear a lot of people say a lot of a lot of horn players say like like when I first heard your joint, the harmonies you was doing with your vocals it sound like it sound like a trumpet. It sound like trumpet harmonies, and I never noticed that. But I might be taking like my early trumpet experience, you know, from from being in bands and playing second cornet, third cornet, and actually adapting that to you know the vocals to actually you know harmonies. So okay. I think that does come across. Okay. So when you were young, learning how to play, um, 
where did being a hip hop and being MC come into that focus? Because you learned at first to be a musician and all of a sudden you transitioned into, um, I don't know how many people know he was actually an MC before he was an R&B artist before. Yeah. So how, how, did, how did that work? You know what I'm saying? How did hip hop become kind of that focus from playing the piano to like writing 16 bar? <laughs> Um, early on, I was, you know, I was heavy into, um, um, you know, Marvin, the Donnies, listened to a lot of Miles Davis, Freddie Hubbard, Coltrane, you know, Miles bought me a record player when I was early, so I'd go downstairs and I'd steal her records, you know, sorry mama. <laughs> And she didn't have it, you know, she ain't had no trial called Quest or uh, Two Chains. You know what I'm saying? So, so I took what I had access to, you know, and that's what it was. Once I got to high school, um, I was heavy into music, but um, nobody around me was really doing jazz. You know, they had, uh, they had gotten rid of the, the choir and they had gotten rid of the, um, the band program at the school. So all of my friends were rapping. And of course, you know, if everybody around you is rapping, I'm like, well, let me try this thing too. You know, they coming to me for the production. I'm like, well, you can do it, I can do it too. You know, so I got into rap. I did that for a long, long time. I went through a lot of funny names. A lot of funny names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you started rapping, graduated from high school, do a year at Wayne State. You decide, uh, school's not for me. I'm gonna just kind of work on my thing and work at AAA and kind of just hold my, hold my Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. He, he used to work for AAA, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Underground doing his thing. Thank you for calling Triple A. My name is Andwale. How may I assist you? I still got it. Ball head, tie, all of that. Slacks. So, when you connected to high school and connected with T3 and Batin and y'all were starting there, how did they find out you could actually sing? Did they know you could sing from the jump or was it kind of like they kind of around about her? When I met them, I was playing at a, at a spot called Cafe, Cafe Mahogany in Detroit. Um, and there was a band every Wednesday. It was a guy named Malik Austin. And I had, um, I think I went to a show, one of his shows, and I was like, yo, I play keys. He was like, really? He was like, why don't you come out, you know, jam with us one day? So I came up there, you know, and, and we jammed, and I was like, yo, I got a Fender Rose. He's like, oh, man, you should come play with the band. So I started playing with him every week at Cafe Mahogany. And this was like, I don't know if y'all know about a Fender Rose. This is a big old school piano. It's about 80 pounds, easy, you know, maybe more than that. And I would load the piano up, it was Sunday nights. I would load the piano up in my, what kind of car was I driving in? The Avenger? I think I had that Avenger, that Dodge Avenger. I would load that car, I would load the piano up in the car. I would drive it downtown, pull it out, play, load it back in the car, go home about 12, one o'clock in the morning and unload that joint and be up at seven o'clock to go to work. Usually eight o'clock. I was always late, <laughs> but um, that's how I met. That's how I met. Um, I think it was by ten. By ten used to used to sell incense down at Cafe Mahogany oh, on really? Sunday nights. <laughs> and um, so by ten I was like, Yo, man, got that from the rules, man. You know, I'm in Slum Village. And at this time, I had just like started learning about Slum Village, cause uh, a, a, a artist or a DJ by the name of House Shoes yeah. used to always spin uh, Dilla tracks and Slum Village tracks at uh, the shelter or St. Andrews. Right. And so I was like, yo, you, you a slum? Like, all you to do? He's like, yeah, yeah, man, that's me. So he brought T3 around. So I met by 10 and T3 first. They went and told JD at the time, was, he, he was going by JD. They went and told Dilla about, about me. And that's how I met Dilla. You know, Dilla came down and, and so I met the crew. I ended up, you know, down in, 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 in Dilla's mama's basement, which was a studio. And, um, I got to see them work, you know what I'm saying, and, and, and I created, a, uh, that kind of created, you know, a chemistry, you know, and um, so at the time I was working with them as far as, you know, I was, I was rhyming, you know, with them, and, and, and I was working with them as far as production, but they knew I sang on the side, though. Okay. Yeah. So how was it, um, which gives me a good segue into talking about Jay Dilla, who we just celebrated his birthday yesterday, he would have been 39, Woo! just one of the most amazing producers, you can make some noise for yeah. that guy. But really, you know, do people get a chance to be in that room and work with him? And, and so, what was that experience like for those of us who would never get the chance to kind of sit in that room? It was crazy. I always say that Dilla on on an MPC was like was like a courtroom stenographer. You know, the person that sits down and, and all you see is their hands doing this. 
right. people were talking. Uh -huh. It was like that. That's how it was with the MP. You just saw his hands move. It, you couldn't comprehend it was going too fast. You couldn't comprehend what it was doing, what he was doing. But the the the, the music that came out of that, it was like, I was like, how did you just do it? I sat and watched him make a beat, like a ridiculous beat, and like two minutes, just to see if he could do it in two minutes, and he did it. And it was unbelievable, you know what I'm saying? It could have easily been on a common record, a Bustin' Rhymes record, you know? And um, it was just wild, you know, just just, just being in his presence and, and, and being able to witness, you know, greatness that close up and have access to that, you know? I could pick up a phone and call him if I had a problem, or if I had a question with the MP, you know? And, and he would always teach me tricks, so just to have access to that, I felt, you know, blessed. And I remember, um, one time we was in the studio, we were working on Think Twice okay. for the Welcome to Detroit album. And we all grown here, you know, we've all, you know, some of us have, you know, dabbled in um, <laughs> extracurricular uh, <laughs> activities with uh, rolled cigarettes. Right. And, um, <clears throat> yeah. 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 <laughs> so we was in the studio, and I never, a lot of people think that was me singing on Think Twice. That wasn't me. That wasn't me singing. That was Dilla singing. And I just did the, the music for it. I did, like, you know, the, the keys and the, the trumpet and the, um, you know what I'm saying, the bass and all of that. Right. But I sat there and watched them in the studio, and I've never in my life seen somebody light a joint, get in front of the microphone, hit the joint, hold it, and say, Baby, we are the big twins. Oh. Yeah, I've never in my life. <laughs> Never in my life. So right then, I said, that's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Nobody I know could do that and sing right on at the same time. Roll cigarettes, ladies and gentlemen. Right. Roll cigarettes. <laughs> Clarification. All legal here. <laughs> so, what was the experience like? Where was the moment when you said, I'm going to make this demo called Rise, and I'm actually going to put it on cassette, and I'm going to try to sell it to see if people like it? Like, cassette. <laughs> right. Nobody knows. He he only made a hundred cassettes of that album Rise, and nobody wants to give him up because I've been looking for like six years to try to get one. You know what's crazy? I saved one for myself, and I left it like in the in the dashboard of my car. <laughs> it's done. <laughs> like like snow in July. <laughs> Over. Man, what was that experience like? What what made you say, okay, I'm gonna put this together? And I'm just gonna see how this gonna work. Um, family and friends, they're like, you know, that, that music sounds good. You need to, you need to do something with it. You need to put it out. And one day I woke up <laughs> and I said, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, take a little bit of this AAA money. You know what I'm saying? Press up a couple cassettes, not showing my age. I'm 21 with a few years experience. Right, right. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna push up a couple of these, you know, tapes and, and see how people feel about it. I was thinking, you know, 100 to do the job, you know, I'm brand new, you know, um, if I get rid of these, then I'm good, you know what I'm saying? And I sold those in a week, like they were playing it in between, they used to do poetry night at Cafe Mahogany, and in between the poets, they would play the music, and they would sell them at the back table, you know, so people was like, yo, what is that? They get up and they go holler at the, you know, go holler at the city, go at the cassette. Yeah, that's one of my favorite <laughs> <laughs> Um and also around AAA too, you know, AAA, I worked at the headquarters, you know, it's a huge building, but right. everybody knew I did music, I don't know why it was. I was working at the mail room, I guess. And so I used to like, I, I, you know, I used to go to all the different departments, and so I met a lot of people, and I guess in the past, I was like, hey, by the way, I do music. I don't know how they knew, I don't know. But yeah, I sold them all in the week. I sold them all in the week, yeah. Didn't, didn't, but didn't want to press no more after that. I was content with that. I thought I made it. I sold, I sold 100 cassettes, dude, and I made it. So you went from Rise, and now you go to create uh, the first album, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's called Subject. Yes. Wow. Um, now is that young guy? Yeah, who is this young gentleman right here? Had the corn rolls in the head. Yeah. Yeah. So long ago. Uh, but you took some some stuff from the Rise album and put it on here, and then you also added some new stuff. Um, one thing I want to talk about this album, which first attracted me uh, to you as an artist, is um, kind of the art of storytelling and how you put an album together from the first song to the end, how it's all kind of coagulated into one major story. Um, 
When it comes to songwriting, is that something you seek when you started writing songs? Was there something about telling stories that like stuck with you in order to do that? Or how did you come about in your um, songwriting being most like a storyteller? Um, usually, usually, I'm gonna say this. The first album is always the easiest. I heard somebody say it once before. They said your first album is the easiest one to make because you have your, your whole lifetime to create it. So at that point in time, I had like a a, a a a vault full of songs, you know what I'm saying? And usually the way the way I the way I uh, make a song is I make the music first, and I sit down, listen to the music. I kind of let the music dictate, you know, what I write and how I write. Okay. You know, and I think when it when you know when it comes time to make an album, I figure I was going to be the opening track, and I make songs, and I figure out you know what songs kind of make sense together. Um, but it's all about f filling in the puzzle pieces, you know. You you look into your can, you see what songs you have that uh, that 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 you can maybe connect and, and make a story with, you know. And, and and from that you do what you can, and then you just fill in the pieces. Like, well, I gotta make a segue from this song to that song, so let me make a song about this, you know. Or let me do an interlude that kind of connects and, and, and makes it make sense, you know. Okay. Um, and another thing about this album, which. Um you know, rare, very rarely in commercial music or even in underground music, do you get a songwriter that makes you think. You know, pretty much songs now, they, they tell you exactly what they, hey, this is what I'm gonna do to you, and this is how I'm gonna do it, and, and how many ways I can do it to you, and you ain't had it done like this before. Um, very rarely do you get an album or a songwriter who you have to go, what is he saying? And you have to sit. Um, and how I got introduced to Dwelling It, um, back in 2003, when this album came out, and he was doing a promo tour, um, I was working at Dillard's. I don't know if y'all know what Dillard's Department yeah. Store is. <laughs> Just came fresh out of college, out of FAMU. Ow. Everything had hit. You know, I was an engineering major, no job was going on. So I'm like, okay, I got to do something to make some money. And so um, we were working at Dillard's. And so I'm from Fort Lauderdale. The Dillard's that I worked in at Briar Mall. They never have nothing for black people, like nothing. It's just really boring. They sell old clothes for old people. You know, it was just nothing there. So that morning, they told us like, oh, we're going to have 99 Jams, which is one of the uh, urban stations. We were so happy. We didn't know what to do. We all have, oh, yeah, let's go. We're going to be rocking, right? And so um, they come in, and they do the promo, and they set up, and they were doing a radio show. And so lo and behold, this guy that nobody knows comes in, and he's chilling. And so they start playing a couple of his tracks, and, and you know, with me and one of my friends, we love music, we love soul. We were like, that dude sounds nice. Yeah. You know, we kind of rocking, we had it, and we trying to hide from our manager so they don't see us dancing in the, in, the, in, the, in the store. And, you know, all of a sudden, so we got curious. We was like, yo, let's just go find out, like, who he is, like, because nobody knew his name. So we just go find out. And so we went over to talk to Dwelle. We was like, hey, man, what's your name? He's like, I'm Dwelle, you know, I'm from Detroit. You know, I'm you know, promoting my album, blah, 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 da, da, da. Okay, great. Cool, man. Nice to meet you. Love your music. You know, all that. So we go back to other departments. And so when the promo was over, he came over and gave each one of us a signed CD and wrote, like, this long note. It wasn't even like a book that was like, you know, thank you for coming and checking out my music. I really appreciate all the things you did. That was really cool, man. You know, check me out. You know, and signed it. So we was like, all right, cool. And, um, yeah, it was so, he was like, yeah, that was cool. And, you know, he did the album, put it out, and so I put it in the deck. And I think I sat in my car for, like, three hours. Because I heard, this was music I had never heard before. Um, and for people who know me, who know I'm a big, huge soul person, this was actually the person that introduced me to what was underground and independent soul. Because I had never, I was loving Joe and uh, Dave Hollister. That's all I thought I could listen to. So, you know, hearing this and getting this tape and just was, you know, figuring out and going through all that music. Uh, one thing, one of the good things about him as a songwriter is he, he's very kind of subliminal. It's not like, you know, a pretty message that you just know bluntly. You have to actually listen to the lyrics in order to figure out what he's talking about. And so I always wanted to know, is that something that, that always started with you as a songwriter? Or was that kind of like, you know, you kind of grew into kind of always hiding the messages and stuff like that in your music? I didn't even know I did that. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember starting off in 2003, I used, I used to be so happy. Like, you want my autograph? I did use the right paragraph. Like, you took me back. Man, I remember, I, 
Man, I used to write paragraphs on everybody saying everybody, like the whole sheet inside of the thing is like written. Like I still have it, and like at my office, like Man. yo, I really appreciate you for coming and stopping by the booth and checking me out. And I was like, yeah, all right, cool. I remember, I remember when it stopped. I remember, I remember the last time I did it. I was in London. I was in London, and I signed every every CD in the building. Paragraphs, dude. I was there. The place was. They was like, you gotta go. <laughs> My hand wouldn't move the next day. I said, I can't do that no more. Every now and then, though, I, I get that. I get that feeling. I gotta. You know, go. I'm sorry. What was your question? But yeah. <laughs> but I, we in, in in doing high music. Yeah. High high messages. Yeah. Um, I think I just try to. When I make music, I try I try to make music where like from the jump it, it grabs you and you're like, yeah, I like this song. And then two years later, you're like, oh man, wait, is he talking about? You know, and it kind of and it and it, it kind of comes back to you, kind of like the music like like that keeps on giving a little bit, you know. Yeah, and that, and to me that's one of the most underrated things about Dwelle is it's, it's music that will continue to get to you not only from a musical standpoint, but even the intellectual. I remember, you know, when I first got the next album, which was Some Kind of, um, and one of the interludes where he talks about, you know, you know, your Kenwoods and, and Twelves, and I was like, what are you talking about, speakers? And I was like, nah, what is on your body that you got that's like twins? You know, you had to kind of like explain, you know, you know, chill bumps, why does chill bumps gather around, you know, and all, you know, it was kind of like, just to see what's popping. Just to see what's popping. It was like, you know, it was like, Oh, that's what he's talking about. He's trying to be a little fast there, I don't, you know. But it's it's just you know when you get music that makes you think, um, and that's one of the most underrated things about what outside of this musicianship um, that I really wanted to talk about. Um, I really wanted to thank you um, because you really get that from songwriting in any, in any genre from anyone to kind of put thought um, into writing your music, and I really wanted to say thank you. I appreciate you for that. Um, but one of the things that used to be funny. Um, Dwelly had a site called Dwelly.net that, oh man, uh, wow, that's not talking about it. No, that's talking about it. It was a great site, and he used to have a forum that a lot of people used to come, and he would come on and talk, and we would always have conversations, and, and you would learn more about what he was doing, and we would clown. And I remember one of the things they always used to talk about Dwelly is, like, why did you never curse in his songs? Why did you never curse in your songs? Because my mama would have, uh... <laughs> Smack me upside my head. <laughs> um, I'm a grown now though, so I do it, but I still kind of disguise it. <laughs> <laughs> but let's talk about the uh, Some Kind of album. Um, it was kind of, you know, people heard about subject, it was critically acclaimed, and, um, but Some Kind of was kind of the more opening up to the broader audience. Um, how did you feel that album did for you in your career, and what is your favorite song on that album? Wow. Blackjack. <laughs> some kind of, some kind of definitely. It's it's hard, it's hard for me to pick a favorite album. It's even harder to pick a favorite song off of albums because you know they all my babies, man. Right. You know, um, I definitely feel like some kind of was um was a uh, more had more of a jazz feel. You know, it was it was, it was more of the jazzy albums that I've done. That's just where I was at that point in time. Um. I feel like it was good, you know. People always say that, you know, that they, everybody was telling me about the sophomore jinx, and it kind of, you know, it scared me. It scared me a lot, you know. But I just, I just did what I felt, you know. Um, if I had to pick a favorite song off of the Some Kind of album, I don't know. That's impossible, man. Flapjacks is definitely, definitely one of my favorites. And then again, my lover, like, is one of my favorites. Oh, man. Just home right there. Yeah, but um. The title track, the title track, some kind of, you know, um, because at that point in time, I was known for making love songs, and excuse me, I wanted to put a spin on it. I wanted to talk about, you know, family love, and I always wanted to tell, you know, my family story, and I feel like I had a chance to do that, you know, with the with the some kind with the song, some kind of, and I got a chance to finally feature my little brother, you know, playing trombone on the joint, right. which made it even more about family, you know. So, so that was that's definitely one of my favorites off that album. Now. Do you like working with your brother? Um, now I'm starting to see, you know, this is not funny, but I remember, you know, first album and ever, now you start to see more and more, you start to get him involved in your work. Um, how is that working with yourself? Because some people don't like working with their family. But. Look at this, okay. <laughs> <laughs> me, me and my little brother, we were, we were, it was a big brother, little brother thing for a long time. You know, I used to bully him, 
He used to bug, you know, the mess out of me. Get away from me, man. You know, all of that. We went through that, but I don't know. My little brother is grown for his age. Like, if he was here, you would probably think he was an older brother. And it's been that way, you know, for a long time, for a real long time. Um, but musically, I kind of feel like, you ever seen that movie Multiplicity? Yeah. I kind of feel like my brother is like, that's like my, my better half, you know what I'm saying? If I could clone, I wish, I, like if I, it's, it's like I was sitting in bed, I was like, yo, I wish I could clone myself so I could do more at one time. And then he came in the room like, hey. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, now let's move on to the next album, which is uh, Sketches of a Man. And it's kind of from, from an outside perspective, the people are like a little bit more commercial, you know, you're kind of being more R&B, especially with Body Rock, which has now become like a crowd favorite, but at first everybody's like, oh, Body Rock, I don't know if it's Yeah, it was different for, for most of your fans. Um, so how do you feel about as an artist trying to expand? Because you know, a lot of times when you get that first crew of your fans and they first love you, they only want you to stay in that lane. And if you start going outside that lane, stay then right, stay right here, bro. Right, you're like, in this box, if you move outside, it's, it's a problem. Um, how has that been dealing that um, for you as an artist? Because I know a lot of artists go through when they just got like, I just want to expand and do something, and then everybody goes, no, you got to do the same thing. You know, when you think about that, you also think about like D'Angelo just now coming back and, you know, kind of doing things a little bit different, and everybody's like, well, I kind of want the old D'Angelo to come back. So, how do you deal with that as an artist? I mean, I think I think the, the the main thing to remember is the the main thing to do as an artist is to not forget, you know, because as you know, I I remember looking up and and, and hearing Stevie Wonder joints, you know what I'm saying, and at a certain point in time, Stevie Wonder started to change and he started doing you know different stuff, and I was kind of disappointed, like like Stevie, I want '70s Stevie back, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. and then you know the, the tables turn and. I was some young person, Stevie Wonder, you know what I'm saying? Right. So I can't get mad, you know, if, if somebody says that to me, but now I see it from Stevie's standpoint. You know, you want to expand, you want to try different things. You know I can do this, now let me try this, you know what I'm saying? Let me try different things, let me expand myself, you know? I, and I understand that. Um, the uh, Sketches of a Man album, to me, it kind of felt like, I was all over the place on the Sketches of a Man album, right. you know what I'm saying? Like, I felt like that album had more of a mixtape feel to it. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Um, it was less of a story. Well, I guess it was. It, 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 had, it had somewhat of a storyline. So it's like not not as much as the first two. Yeah, yeah. But um, I think it was it was just more. I was I was kind of all over the place. I was pulling from a lot of different places, from a lot of different experiences. Everything from five dollar mic to 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 Vane, You know what I'm right. saying? So it was kind of all over the place. But I definitely have like favorites on that. Um, What's your favorites on that? Five dollar mic and vein. Really? <laughs> <laughs> traveling girl is one of my favorites on it too. Right. I like traveling girl. Yeah. And you, you you did bring maybe about four or five tracks that you had done underground and put it kind of redid them. Yeah, yeah, album. yeah. Yep. So even like the even like the qualities in songs were different. Right. You know, and and that kind of that that kind of set mixtape to me. Okay. You know what I'm saying? But it it, it was kind of like it was one of those it is what it is type of albums, and I liked it. Now you were also going through kind of like a label change at that time. You know, yeah. you would kind of change it from different things and, um, you know, being that you started off young and kind of independent, kind of do your thing, then you got signed right after the rise and then now going through that. Um, how has that experience been for you and how have you been able to, even though with label changes, because when you think about an artist like uh, Maxwell, who when he was going through different label changes and management left, he kind of got shelved for a long time before yeah. he could come out with music. How have you been able to kind of continue to just put out music despite the label change? Um, I think I think it helps, you know, that I have a good a good team around me. You know, they, they keep me working, they keep me busy. Um, I think I think the problem that a lot of artists run into also is that they rely on their label and they rely on their budget, you know, to go get producers, to go get writers, you know, and um and I got I kind of I do all of that at home, you know what I'm saying? So it was really no fall off, you know, as, as far as that goes. Um, but in switching from Virgin to E1 Records, I did, it was, it was kind of like, I, I didn't know what to expect, you know, because all I had known of the industry was Virgin Records. Right. I'm like, what does this mean now that I'm moving to, to an E1? Like, what happens now? And um, ultimately, I mean, now, sitting down in Atlanta in 2013, I think it was a good move, right. you know, um, because now it's, it's the age of, of, of the self-made, 
you know, the self-made artist. Like, you don't necessarily need a major label to to put a single out or to shoot a video. Right. All you need is a YouTube and a laptop and a five-dollar mic. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Get it done. You know, and and so I think it was a good move. You know, the fact that I that that, that I do everything and I have a 